So I hope, I hope everyone is reading along uh, in the Bible uh, with us. If you are, then this week we'll be reading the second half of 2 Corinthians. Uh, Mary mentioned this morning um, how much uh, she and Larry are getting out of reading it together, that they uh, read slowly through it during the week, and then at the end of the week they reread the entire passage. I know that Rahan and I, when we go that slowly, gives us really gives us a chance to talk about what we're reading and think about other passages that we re relate to what we're reading, and we're, we're getting so much out of it. Um, I also really enjoy it because as we are committed to preaching from what we're reading, it, it I don't know how to say this, but it kind of forces me um, not just to fall back on, on themes that I'm comfortable with and preaching the same things that I preached in the past. It kind of, it kind of trains me to go through and ask God, God, what do you want us talking about this morning? And so as I read the first half of 2 Corinthians, I got to the third chapter and I said, oh, wow, this is great. I want to preach on this. And God said, keep reading. So I got to the fourth chapter and I, I read something. I said, oh, I, this is even better. I'll preach on this. And God said, keep reading. So we're going to be in the sixth chapter of uh, 2 Corinthians this morning. And we're going to talk about holiness. We're going to talk about holiness. Holiness is something that, that we don't really, I don't hear talked about as such a whole lot. And a lot of people, I think, don't even know what holiness means. We sort of have this vague notion that, that holiness means to be good all the time, right? The word holiness literally means to be separated. And when we see it in the context of the Bible, it means that we are separated from the world to the service of God and His kingdom. God is holy because He can be nothing else. He can be nothing but pure and righteous and in service of Himself and His kingdom. We, on the other hand, have to become holy. And we can only become holy by God. We have no holiness in and of ourselves. But bear in mind that the word, that as we become holy, we become more and more different from the world more and more separated from the world, and more and more um, committed to and in tune with and walking in those works that God prepared for us for and that righteousness um, that He intended for us. So I'm going to start by reading 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 7, 1. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And I want to flip over to one other passage real quick because when I think of holiness and God's call on our life to be holiness, uh, my mind always turns to 1 Peter 1. I'm going to read it real quickly. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, which says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as you did in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Now, when I hit that verse and I read that verse, I think, seriously? Seriously? I'm going to be holy like God is holy? And the answer is, no, I'm really not. 
But that's the standard. That's the standard. And that's anything short of that is short of the glory of God. And one of the reasons Jesus had to die on the cross is because I'm not capable of being holy as he is holy. Nonetheless, he calls us to holiness. And one of the things he tells us to do is to separate us, separate ourselves from the world, to not be unequally yoked with others who are not of, who are not of a like mind. And, and first, I want to talk about what it means to be yoked. Do not be unequally yoked, because I think that's part of the key here. We all know what a yoke is, right? It's a, it's a, it's a device that you strap two animals to, and, and you used years ago, before we had tractors, right? They used it to, to plow with, and most people don't know this, but the tractor did not become, did not overtake horses and mules and oxen in this country as the, as the, as the primary source of farming until 1930. Prior to 1930, um, Prior to 1930, it was mostly draft animals. But you put a yoke on, and, and you have to be careful to put two animals that are of equal strength together. Otherwise, otherwise you'll plow in a circle, or one will take off and leave the, or you'll break the yoke, or it, it doesn't work. Um, and likewise, God uses that, that simile. He uses that comparison and tells us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. When we hit this passage, I think most people, the first thing they think of is marriage. And there's a good reason why we think of marriage, because that, that relationship is a yoking relationship more than any other relationship we're going to have in this life, except for our relationship with the Lord. But in terms of our relationship with another person, marriage, because if we do it biblically, it's until death do us part. We are... We are tied to that person. We are yoked to that person for the rest of our lives. And, and when I talk to men in jail, a lot of them read this verse and they think that's all it pertains to. It pertains to far more than that, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. But it certainly pertains to marriage. And I'm not, going to, I'm not here to dwell on marriage this morning, but I do want to go to a, a passage um, that speaks to marriage. This is Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7, 3 through 6, which says, Nor shall you make marriages with them. And he's talking to, this is Moses talking to the, to the Israelites, talking to the, the Hebrew nation, talking to the people shortly before they're to move over into the promised land. And they're going to go into this land that's full of people who are not believers in the one true God. Nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, so that the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a holy people, to the Lord God, the Lord your God, the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. There's that word holy again. And, and we know, we have a wonderful example. We talked about it this morning. We have a wonderful example of what happened to Israelites who married non-Israelites. We have, we have a great example in Solomon. Um, and I didn't load this, but I'm going to, just to remind us what happened to Solomon. Solomon fell in love with lots of women who were not Israelites. And in verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 4 of 1 Kings, it says, For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. And then it says in verse 6, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. And in verse 9 it says, So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel. Boy, how would you like to have it said in the word of God that you had done evil in the sight of God and that God had become angry with you? 
Solomon lost his holiness. He, did, he failed to separate himself from those things that were going to separate him from God. And so most people think of marriage, and, and, and well, they should. One of the things that comes up in jail constantly, constantly, um, is, well, what should I do about dating? What should I do about having a girlfriend? What should I do about my wife? And, and everybody's heard this verse, or they've come across this verse, and, and they're looking for a workaround. And you'd be surprised what I hear. Oh, but Ted, I'm so in love with her. You know, and I just, I know, I know she's going to, you know, clean up her act. I know she's going to, or it's, Ted, I'm so in love with her. And she's told me that when I get out of jail, she'll start going to church. Mm. And well, you know, if, 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 to, if to you, going to church is the be-all, end-all of having a relationship with God, we need to start with you, okay? And then we'll work on her. Um, Oh, but Ted, but Ted, she's so beautiful. I know she'll turn out. We need to wait on the Lord. We need to be led by the Spirit. God has, God has a woman prepared for each man and a man prepared, at least for those that are his, for those that are his children, his believers. For the men he has a woman prepared, for the women he has a man prepared. And we need to be patient and wait on the Lord. The problem is we become impatient or... Or we start, we start thinking with our eyes um, instead of being led by the Spirit. And it's, it's, uh, it's interesting how often that comes up. I've heard men say, I've heard men say, well, you know, Ted, I, I, I'm, just so, I'm just so solid. I'm just so solid. I know I can change her. Uh, time out. Doesn't work that way. Could you, were you able to change yourself? Well, no, but I think I can change her. Uh, I think you want to change her, but um, my recommendation to you is that you do it God's way, that you let go of those, let, let, go, of that, let go of that girl. Um, and when the time is right and you need to be patient, um, God, will, God will reveal her to you. And not only that, if God has prepared her for you, it doesn't matter what she looks like. She's going to be beautiful in your sight. She's going to be beautiful in your eyes. And not only that, if she's the woman that God picked out, she'll be beautiful forever. She'll be beautiful for the rest of your life. But, but again, this passage is more about dating and marriage. It says that we're not to be unequally, unequally yoked with others. And I think of a passage in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15.33. which says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Not only is it chilly this morning, it's dry. So now we need to think about what it means by company. We need to be careful who we hang around with. We need to be careful who we spend time with. We need to be careful who we make our friends. Because the Bible is very, very clear. Evil company corrupts good habits. And this is something else I hear in jail a lot. Oftentimes from men that I've seen in jail previously. They say, oh, Ted, I am so strong in the word. I am, I am so solid. I can go back to those people. I can go back to those places. I can go back to those bars. I can go back to those parties, and I won't be tempted. I'll go in there, and I'll spread the gospel. And they're back in six months or ten months. And it's always the same. I wasn't as strong as I thought I was. I thought I was stronger than Satan himself. And I went around those things and I went around those places that got me in the pit in the first place and somehow I ended up in the pit again. And we hear that over and over and over again. Now the flip side of that is that we need to be really careful that we don't look at this verse and say, 
ah, I'm off the hook. I don't need to talk to anybody unless they're my brother in Christ. I don't need to talk to anybody unless they go to church with me. I can isolate myself. I can just stay home. I can be all to myself. I can keep to myself. I have no responsibility to go out and spread the gospel. I'm, I'm being holy. I'm being set aside. Um, except that's also, that's also wrong. We are still instructed to reach the lost. And in fact, when Jesus prays for his apostles, I love what he prays. He says, God, I do not ask that you take these men out of the world. I ask that you protect them from the evil one. We need to be protected. We need to have our armor cinched up. We need to be solid in the word of God. We need to be prayed up. And when we go out, we need to be led by the Spirit. When the Spirit talks to that one, we need to talk to that one. When the Spirit says, stay away from that one, we need to stay away from that one. We need to be led by the Spirit. And, and just to kind of underscore that point, I want to flip over real quickly to Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse 9 and 10. The Word of God says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So clearly, clearly the Word of God is telling us to do good to all. To do good to all. And to do that, we have to interact with all. If we're going to minister to somebody, whether it's help them pay a bill, whether it's pray with them, whether it's listening to them because something's on their mind and on their heart, whether it's time to say, listen, my friend, if you don't own a Bible, let me get, you, let me get your Bible. You need to get in the Bible and start reading it. And not only that, but until you come to that point that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you're going to continue to have this problem. You're going to continue to be unhappy. You're going to continue to get in messes. You're going to continue not to experience those blessings in your life. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So we need to be led by the Spirit so that we understand what it means not to keep evil company, but we also understand what it means to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we were going to just go to that verse, don't keep evil company, and and just wrap our arms and just and just get focused on it and and think of no other verse we would all probably want to move away from red rock the fact is god has placed us here because the fields are ripe for harvest and there are a lot of lost people who need what we have we have the words of life the words of truth the words of salvation we have them they have been given to us a precious 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 heritage and if we don't go out and share that, we're like the man who was given a talent and the master came back and said, where's my profit? He said, well, there's no profit, but, but I didn't lose any of it. He says, take that away from him. Give it to the one who has 10 talents and turn him over to the torturers. He's not talking about money here. He is talking about us having the most valuable, most precious gift of all, the knowledge of eternal life in Lord Jesus Christ and not doing anything with it, not multiplying it, not taking it out and growing it, not investing it, not doing as we're told to fulfill the Great Commission. And so I want to get back to this idea of holiness. The passage we met, we read, talked about not being unequally yoked, but it's ultimately talking about holiness, and holiness ultimately means to be separated from the world. And so I want to spread, I want to stretch this idea of holiness beyond just the company we keep to our surroundings, to the things we listen to, the things we speak, the things we watch. Because what we fill ourselves up with, that's really going to become who we are. We can't, we can't spend our time watching evil things and ungodly things and reading ungodly literature and listening to ungodly music and think 
that when we open our mouth, what's going to come bubbling out is going to be righteousness. Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of... The, the, I need to go read it. Um, this is going to be in Matthew, the fifth chapter. I'm sorry, the sixth chapter, 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? We need to separate ourselves from the world. Um, Y'all know that Rahan and I don't have a television. We haven't had a television set in 16 or 17 years. Haven't missed it one little bit. In fact, if anything, we wish we'd gotten rid of it a little bit earlier. And interestingly enough, what finally broke the camel's back, we didn't watch, we never did watch much television. Um, I don't sit still well enough to watch a television show, but I would turn it on each morning and catch the, it was weather on the nines, I think, weather on the eights, weather on the nines, weather would come on every 10 minutes. So I'd turn it on, wait until the weather on the nines came on, see what the weather's going to be like, turn it off, and leave. And one morning I was about to leave, I was waiting for the weather to come on, and a commercial came on that was so disgusting that I turned the TV off and I said to Rohana, you know, it'd be just fine with me if we didn't have a, t have a TV. By the time I got home, work from wor home from work that day, we didn't have a TV. And uh, one of the best things we've done for our home, because, you know, it was so frustrating because you could find a, a wholesome TV show, right? Home and garden television. We're going to learn how to, how, to, how to make better rose bushes today, right? And the commercials would come on and Satan would start pumping filth into our home. And it doesn't matter if you have a Bible in your lap and you turn your head down and you look at the Bible every time the commercials come on because Satan is still pumping that filth into your home. And to underscore this point, I want to turn back to Deuteronomy. This is Deuteronomy 7, 25, and 26. The Israelites are about to start con conquering the promised land, and they're about to go into Jericho and conquer Jericho. And we all know the story of the conquest of Jericho. And here's what God says to the people. Nor shall you bring an abomination into your house lest you be doomed to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. Don't even bring it into your house. Rahana and I have a little ritual that we started, quite frankly, um, as soon as we get saved, got saved. And we go through our house about once a year. We look at every book title. We look at <laughs> we have a stack of DVDs. We haven't watched one in three years, but we've got a stack of them. And we go through the stack to make sure that we still feel like every one of them is, is something that we should not be ashamed of as Christians. We go through the books. Um, at the time I became a Christian, um, as you all know, I'm a, trained as a scientist. I had books on a variety of subjects. I had books on paleontology. Um, the books in, themsel in and of themselves are not wicked, but I threw them all away because I didn't want people from the church coming over to my house and seeing books on paleontology and say, oh wow, Ted must believe in dinosaurs and trilobites, trillion, billions of years old, hundreds of millions of years old. And so I just, I just parted with them. Um, same goes for music. When I got saved, I had about 400 record albums and they were all stuff I'd grown up with. Golden oldies. And I just, without even thinking about it. I, actually, if I thought about it, I'd put them all in the dumpster, but I gave them all to my brother-in-law who loved that music and is not a believer. Um, and, and it's funny, when I talk to the men in jail about the rock and roll from the 70s, they say, oh, Ted, that's wholesome rock and roll. It's golden oldies. And all I have to do is quote a couple of lines off of a couple of, you know, number one hits, and it's like, oh, yuck. Um, and then they say, yeah, but country western music is wholesome. My only exposure to country western music is when I go into tractor supply to buy a tractor part or goat feed. 
And I've made the mistake of listening to the words coming out of the speakers in Tractor Supply. And it's the same, it's the same celebration of, of fornication and drugs and alcohol that's on the rock and roll stage. The same exact. So we, we just need to be so discerning. And, and I bet you all have had this experience. Some of you all are going to laugh when I say this. But we go into, go into Walmart. Not any more often than we really have to because they have curbside service right now. But we go in and, and you know, the golden oldies are playing. And they're playing kind of softly. I'm not even listening to them. I get in the truck and I'm driving home. And the next thing you know, I'm humming that whole album. Right? I'm humming that whole album. Steely Dan, Beatles. Um, I'm, humming, I'm humming Led Zeppelin. I'm humming ZZ Top. And I'm like, Ted, get that. And I'm not even noticing it. I'm not even, I'm not even aware that I'm doing it because it's in those file cabinets that I stuffed full of garbage when I was a teenager, when I was in my 20s, before I got saved. I tell the men in jail, I say, guys, don't look at anything that you're not going to be looking at 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 years from now. Don't touch anything that you're not going to want to be touching 10, 20, 30 years. Don't do anything that you're going to look back on and is going to become a stumbling block or a barrier or a problem when you are married to the, God, to the woman that God prepared for you. Don't do it. Don't put it in now because it'll become bubbling up later. Um, I kind of... Uh, I don't know how good everybody else's memory is. I kind of resent how good mine is because garbage comes bubbling up that I stuck in a file cabinet when I was a teenager. And it comes bubbling up when I don't want to see it anymore. I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want to listen to it anymore. So when we think about holiness, we really, really, really do need to think about holiness. We need to think about ourselves being holy, being separated from the world, being different from the world, and being, and being united with the kingdom of God, that being our world. We need to pray without ceasing. We need to be in His Word every day. We need to be watching for those opportunities to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, to spread the good news, to be an encouragement to others, to be a blessing to others. And in order to do that the way God wants us to do that, we need to be separate from the world. Remember, friendship with the world is enmity with God. We need to be separated from those people. We need to be unyoked from those people. We need to break those friendships. Um, I shared this. It always kind of gets a chuckle because a lot of people have been here and done this. But when I got saved, and you all have heard me say this before, when I got saved, God told me to Stop smoking pot. And he wasn't real subtle about it. He didn't want me smoking pot. So I did. I quit when he told me to. Haven't, haven't caught a buzz since then. Not, not on that stuff. Uh, and I didn't have a, never have had a whole lot of friends. Um, maybe I'm just not a real friendly guy. Um, uh, in fact, y'all know this. When Rahan and I became Christians, we had to get rid of our doormat. We had a big doormat on our house, and it said, go away. You ready to get rid of it. But I called all five of my friends, and I said, hey, come on over. Let's jump in the bay and go fishing. Hey, come on over. Let's grab guitars and strum some, make up some music. Hey, come on over. I have not seen a single one of those men, not a one, not once since then. Praise God. God wanted me separated from those people that had the potential to bring me down. I had a, we had a pastor when we first got saved. We had a pastor who was real fond of saying, you know, when you put on gloves and you play in the mud, the mud doesn't get glovey. The gloves get muddy. And so we, we really do need to protect ourselves. We need to be cognizant of those things that are going to be stumbling blocks for ourselves, um, even as we go out into the world and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, with the whole idea of holiness in mind, I want to turn to one last verse. I don't plan to elaborate on it 
I just want to read it. It's the one I hope all of y'all know. Um, it's in the first Psalm. Um, one of the things I love about reading the book of Psalms is because, first of all, it's, it's so eloquent and so beautiful, and, it's, and, it, and it helps me worship. But it starts with the first Psalm, which um, to me is such a, uh, such a summary of what God wants from us. And so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to turn to it real quick and read it. I'm just going to read the first three verses, Psalm 1, 1 through 3, and, and we'll close this whole idea of separating ourselves out to be holy to God. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen.